Hello, role-playing people, and in this episode of the podcast, we're going to talk about clan weaknesses. Ah, weaknesses. Let me just say I love weaknesses and flaws in my characters and in my players' characters when I GM, because the flaws themselves, depending on how they are portrayed and handled, can lead to very interesting and quite dramatic but highly immersive situations. Let me also say before we begin that I deeply dislike the cheapening of flaws, the thought that a condition that you more or less understand but you will have to live with for the rest of your unlife is somehow a minor inconvenience. It's in the background, doesn't really matter, but hey, it gave you a bit more freebie points. Hmm, I don't like that. Of course, depending on the type of the game, some groups might want to do flaws light so as not to cripple the party and slow down the pacing too much. I can totally understand that, and I must say, this is entirely a matter of my personal preference, the fact that I rather enjoy characters who have not come to terms with their flaws and haven't found a workaround just yet, with the possibility of finding one out throughout the game. Uh, What is my point though? My point is that I love the clan flaws in Vampire the Masquerade. I think they are brilliant and deserve a lot of attention because they can enhance the stereotype and lead you to play right into it, just as well as they can be twisted around and made to play against the stereotype. What do I mean? What I mean is that flaws generate coping mechanisms in the characters. It is not the flaw itself, but the very mechanism here that makes the character interesting to play and portray. Your typical salubri healer, a well-intended and humane vampire, might offer services to its herd, healing and such. They might go to extra lengths to be uh, pleasant and charming so as to persuade the mortal to allow your vampire to feed, for that is their flaw. They can only feed on victims who are willing. Going against the stereotype without playing into the warrior salubri, uh, finding an alternate coping mechanism to this flaw, we can just as easily, albeit unpleasantly play a salubri who frightens their herd into giving them verbal consent. They can easily use anesthetic touch against the mortal's volition and basically kidnap them uh, as they are sleeping. Do you willingly and of your own volition give me your blood? says the salubri kidnapper. And the victim who is now helpless, bound, scared looking at this creature that looks like a very pale woman with lips the color of dark wine, with three eyes, the third one hideous to behold, seemingly bloodied and infected, says, Yes, okay, just don't hurt me. Please let me go. See my point? Every character will deal with their clan flaw according to their own personality, their own morality, and according to what they have been taught by their clan. In absence of that training, of course, well, you fill in the blanks. Um, Another example I'm thinking of, the Bali. Now, the Bali are typically evil, sadistic demon worshippers, yes? They are repelled by all religious paraphernalia and symbols, they cannot stand those things. They are often converts from various other clans and they are embraced in a highly ritualistic fashion. The stereotypical Bali is, willingly, an evil, unclean, sadistic agent of hell. But what if a Bali sets his eyes on a holy man, an old priest, who has spent his entire life in faith and in service to the Lord, only to be hit over the head one night, embraced without much ceremony and thrown into a sewer? Upon awakening, later that night, The man comes to realize he is clinically dead and next to him he finds a journal containing quotes from Dante, quotes from Milton and so on, uh, things that mockingly tell him he has effectively been cast out of the grace of God. He will never, ever be able to serve the Lord he so loves and instead will become an agent of hell in time. 
Imagine the desperation on this man as he tries to pray and cannot bring himself to think the words. He is repelled by the cross around his neck and in an uncontrollable reflex just breaks it, breaks it and throws it into the sewer in the filth of man. He can't ever look upon that cross or any other cross for that matter. He can't go home. He will never enter a church. He will never confess or receive communion. He will never gaze upon the life-giving Son. But he does not give up on his faith because all of the prophets have been tested. It's now his turn. His vampiric condition be damned. He is still a good faithful man and he will continue to be one until the Lord himself releases him from this nightmarish trial. There we have it, a good Bali, an unliving blasphemy to all things unholy. Now, a Ventru who feeds on smokers will be considerably less harmful than one who can only feed on burn victims especially because the temptation to fabricate your own herd is ever-present. So what will this Ventru do? The Toreador are known for their riches, refined taste, beauty and art that probably decorates their havens, but what of the Toreador who has suffered greatly as a result of their flaw and actively shuns everything beautiful, everything creative and artistic, staying away from Elysium, losing any semblance of status and reputation that they might have had in the city. The Zimitsi can easily stuff itself with its own soil, carrying a mere two spadefuls in its own vampiric body, thus having its object of need with it anywhere it might go, or it can spend painfully endless nights, denying the soil, growing weaker and weaker to the point where it can't even think. And then, defeated and aching all over, it crawls onto its earth and weeps. All right, I'll stop the examples here, but you get my point. Yes, the flaws are the same for everyone, mechanically. But they never quite tell the same story, do they? They are a spectrum, if you will. Some particularly strong-willed canites will, will take lightly to their flaws, even wear them as badges of honor, while some sensible and humane kindred might loathe themselves profoundly for their inability to cope with their flaws and the ritualistic behavior they must indulge in. It is at this point in the episode I will invite the listeners who are players of World of Darkness games uh, to really consider what the flaw means for both you as a player and for the character. What narrative options does it open up? How deep is the flaw to this character? How do they cope with it and why do they think this is their best option? Truth is, using the same flaws and mechanics, the ones that are available to all players, you can tell an insanely wide range of stories, all varying in theme and mood, because the character concept and their perceptions changes everything. You don't need to have 10,000 disciplines on a character to make them cool. You don't need a super tight build, combo, disciplines or whatnot. You don't even need to go for the rare and exotic bloodline. You can play a simple Camarilla clan and do it in a way no one in your group has ever thought of before. The character you play is more than its clan, it's more than its build, more than its sect, more than its disciplines. Yes, it's shaped by these things, but it is only as boring, common or stereotypical as you want it to be. Consider that. Thank you very much for listening. Take care, have fun, and don't forget to play.